But we're going to go with Steve, pronouns he, him, calling in from uh, Northern Europe. That's not what it is. I think uh, that maybe I would Nebraska. Like to present, <laughs> uh, says he would like to present evidence for entity-driven transmutation reductive evolution. What is that? Um, we got Steve. You're yeah, online hi, yeah. with uh, Forrest and, and Matt. Hi. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Forrest. And uh, for Matt, I wish him well on his upcoming uh, dental surgery. I, I've had dental implants done, so I know how discomforting and difficult they may be. So hope that goes well for you. Um, but uh, what I um, – oh, and then yeah, I heard your conversation before you jumped to my call. And uh, I uh, – I, you uh, Pine Creek. Have you heard? Or have you heard of that name? You probably have. I didn't. Yeah, I, didn't I want nothing to do in, with him. Yeah, didn't you call in just yeah. recently when I was on with Jimmy and bring that dude up as well? No, that wasn't me. I, that might have been another call. Oh, I just, I just don't think he's got. You a good take called on, in just a little that. bit just, ago like, when I was on with Jimmy. You called in September twenty fifth to say that people who support Kamala aren't open for opposing viewpoints. Yeah, that was when I was on with Jim, and and there yeah, was a, another me, call that same right. that same yeah. video. I right. swear to God, there was another call on that same day that was about so what is it we're talking Pine about Creek today? About atheist debates and stuff. What what is entity driven transmutation reductive evolution? Oh, so, um, that um, defines an entity being the prime mover of reductive evolution mechanisms with a reductive and tropic bias towards the conservation of computational resources. And, Those are um, all words. Mentor predicts that the information sure. entropy of RNA nucleotides will decrease in conjunction with the reductive evolution of an organism genome where genetic redundancy or non-functional uh, genes are deleted should subsequently enable an organism to more efficiently process biological information than did their higher entropic. Where, where are you reading this? So, so yeah. Two things. This Number one, from, I just looked from up a script that I've written myself. Yeah, and, so I um, just looked up this, um, the call with Jim, uh, the other show with Jimmy, and you're right. You weren't the person who brought up Time Creek. I was looking that up because everything you're saying is just genetic entropy. Can we just skip to the argument about genetic entropy and why it's not real? Is that, is that where we're going? Um, well, there's evidence for for this. Um, it's based on no, quantifiable amount of uncertainty. Involved with the single RNA nucleotide being one of four equally probable possibilities, namely adenine, histosine, adenine, guanine, thymine, guanine, and uracil. cytosine are not. Yeah, yeah. There's adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil are five nitrogenous bases. Uh, I th there's not equal probability between them. Uh, like the, I, I don't know where you're getting that or what that's. I, I would. If, I don't if, even know what you're talking if about. If you that. look it up, there, the point there is, info in three P is two bits. And when you when you take the distribution occurrence of them, not what you're the arguing for. Uniform, what you're arguing for, hmm. Steve? Because we can sit here and get into this really, really fucking esoteric language. It it doesn't well, matter. It's not going to help anybody understand what you're talking about. It's it's certainly not going to behoove anybody listening to this call to listen to you and I go back and forth about it. The the core of what you're talking about seems to be the argument of genetic entropy. The idea that as genes mutate, they lose information rather than gaining information, and that mutations degrade yep. rather than yep. build. And yeah, exactly. So like, let's just scrap all of that because it is so unbelievably not worth it to sit here and try to muddy the waters on like how any of that works. It's not worth anybody's time, least of all, you know, the people watching. Um, yeah. I, I the argue the, yeah, sure. Go ahead. I'll, I'll explain why genetic what, what does any of this have to do with the God? Why are we talking about this at all on the show? Okay. Um, because um, organisms are, um, they don't lose their functionality. But their their information is being reduced. Their information content per nucleotide is being reduced. I'm, I'm sorry. My question was, what does this have to do with the God? Data. My question was, what does this have to do with the God? They're, well, as they evolve, they're becoming more efficient at processing um, biological information. My what question is, what does this that? have to do with the God? I said entity. I, I'm not going to put God in there. You can if you like. I'm going to pull with that. I'm My question is, what does this have to do with God? It, even like, dude, if, if you're going to be a friggin' pedantic about it, just what does this have to do with an intelligent designer? 
because that is what this comes down to is blank, blank, blank about DNA is too complex. Therefore, there must be a designer. That's that's what this argument always reduces to. And it makes it's little sense every single time. So why are you driving an intelligent designer out of this situation? Because for number one, it's not true. But even if it was true, where are you getting an intelligent designer from? The computation, the computational conservation of information is as though that's how, the, how the universe would behave if it were simulated. How would it behave if it wasn't simulated? I think that the um, information content would not be over time would remain constant. Maybe it would go well, in how do you, demonstra- and how do you demonstrate that? Well, um, that it, I can't prove what's outside of simulation. All I could do is go so, so far. So basically, you can just say you can just speculate. Basically, you're saying basically you're saying you've concluded that a simulation is the most probable, even though you have no way of analyzing the two options or determining which one's more probable. Well, I would say that uh, I, all I could go is I could only go as far as proving whether or not. I'm sorry, I was asking a very specific like a question computer. to see if I to see if I was encapsulating what you said accurately, which is you're saying you've concluded okay. that a simulation is more probable than not a simulation, while you also admit that you have no way of assessing the likelihood of either. Correct. But what if there's nothing outside the simulation? What if I'm all sorry. Is a, I uh, asked. A, I'm sorry. I asked. I'm sorry. I asked a specific question. You're saying that you've determined that a that a simulation is more probable than a non-simulation, while simultaneously acknowledging that you have no way of telling, uh, of investigating, to determine which one is more probable. And my question was, is that correct? Why won't you answer my question? Well, sure, it is. Uh, well, I'm not. Uh, then I'm not just then I don't give a together. shit what you have to say about anything because you're demonstrating irrationality in reaching a conclusion while contradicting yourself by establishing that you do not have the information to reach a conclusion. Therefore, your assessment is useless and disregarded. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, if it, I encourage you to take some time to learn how mutations actually work and learn why genetic entropy is bullshit because there's plenty of uh, situations where mutations aren't just degrading, aren't just losing information, aren't just, you know, uh, destroying DNA, aren't losing bits of info, all these different things you're talking about. Um, None of this violates the laws of thermodynamics. I heard you throw that one in there as well. None of this makes any difference. And even if it did, then you would be left saying we don't understand the mechanism by which we gain this information. You would have no reason to then go on and say, therefore, there must be this guy that's making this stuff happen somehow. That would be a massive leap of logic and faith that you don't need to be taking. So your premise is wrong and your conclusion is wrong. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Yes, sir. All right. Take care, man. Cool. The like, so just so everybody's aware, when we talk about mutations, and I, I'll be very brief about this. I know this isn't the science show on this one, but like, well, I'll listen to um, you for hours. I just was done listening. <laughs> to Steve. Yeah, it, what, what's what's frustrating about that? There's this famous, like, kind of like just anecdote story thing. Like this, you know, uh, professors and student are talking, and the student says, you know, you know or the professor says, I, I forgot what, how the say, but one person says, how is it? that so many people believed that the sun revolved around the earth instead of the earth revolving around the sun or the earth spinning. Um, yes. And the other person says, uh, well, obviously, because it just looks like that. It looks and like what, what the sun is the revolving around. Yeah, exactly. And they say, okay, so what would it look like if the earth was spinning? It would look exactly like this. And so when you have somebody like Steve calling and saying, well, I, it, it just makes sense. That that you know if if you know, the, the DNA is doing this, that must be simulated because if it wasn't doing that, it would be this other thing. You, how do you check? You have no evidence for that. You have no way of testing this. You're just saying, well, it would be this thing. When what you're describing in either case is what you're seeing, the naturalistic explanation and the intelligent design explanation can both have the same result here. You have to show evidence for this intelligent designer. You can't just say, well, things would be different if it wasn't. And then yeah, expect that to be the entire argument. It's one of those things where we all do this to some extent because it's a fast, wor- fast world. 
and we speak in shorthand and we make assumptions that when I'm using a word, you mean the same thing by the word and that you kind of have some understanding that's similar to mine. And so when people make the it just makes sense argument and they don't always use that particular language to frame it. But it's like, you know, when I look at the world, it just seems more probable that there's a designer than you know an intelligent designer than not. Um, I think mm -hmm. the thing that people need to grasp and I'll, I will try to do a better job of, of explaining this to people, you know, when the situation arises is you are looking at something and you're saying, I'm not exactly sure what my argument is. I'm not exactly sure what the criteria is. I'm not sure what my epistemological justification is, but this is how I feel about this. And you could be right. The entire mm -hmm. thing with, with skepticism and critical thinking is to train your gut, to train your intuitions, to, to, to get more and more better information and a better understanding of reality so that when you come across something new, your instinct, your intuition, your gut training is more likely to be correct than incorrect. And so you could be right. But when you're demonstrating this to others, they don't have your gut, metaphorically or physically, and you need to be able to explain things in a structured sense. This is why there's not a single scientific paper on the planet that goes, after observing the interactions between A and B, we just think it's more likely that, we, we feel like it's, it's probable that you know, th that's not the language of this. And before anybody says, yes, but these, these things can't be addressed by science. Tough. If it's not scientifically, if it's not subject to scientific investigation, then you need to explain what kind of investigation it is subject to, why you find that method of investigation reliable, why we should consider it reliable. Because I'm not just sitting here saying, I'm not going to accept anything that isn't scientifically testable. I accept all kinds of things that may not be scientifically testable, but the criteria for those is a little different. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm also gonna just uh, very briefly, just so everybody knows, uh, you can go check out um, my Light of Evolution videos if you wanna learn a little bit more about mutations. I'm also probably gonna make a biologic about it later on, but there's lots of different kinds of mutations. Mutation doesn't just mean random, scrambling bullshit. Like there's, there's a bunch of different kinds of mutations. Um, a point mutation, if you take, A sequence like this sequence here a b c d e there's a sequence you can do a point mutation which would just be changing one letter a b b d e that's a point mutation we change one letter completely changes the meaning uh, we could do an inversion event a d c b e oh that's supposed to be an e that completely changes we just flip something around backwards we can do a deletion event a E. It's now a totally different sequence. We've changed it again. We can do a duplication event. A, B, C, D, B, C, D, E. It's completely changed again. We can do a translocation event where we take some gene from uh, some part of a gene from some other place in the genome and move it over here. A, B, C, W, X, Y, D, E. Again, it's, it's changing it again. And so like there's there's lots and lots of different types of mutations out there. What I've given are very rudimentary introductory ones. Um, they're just the basics. But like you can you can have all sorts of different like ways that genes can be moved around and, and mixed up and turned around and duplicated and all sorts of things. Silent uh, 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 a point mutation can be either silent, meaning it has no real effect, nothing changes. It can be a missense mutation, meaning it codes for a different amino acid now and changes the protein that it was coding for. It can be a nonsense mutation, meaning it codes for stop and it completely, the rest of that uh, protein is not being synthesized anymore. Proteins sometimes do, do dual coding, which means you start reading at different points on the gene and produce different effects. Um, uh, genes uh, include introns and exons. The introns have to be removed. Um, in order to to mature the DNA, depending on which introns are removed or where or why, you can produce different effects, different genes, or, uh, or the gene can be expressed in different ways. So there, there's a million different factors that play in here. And none of that's even bridging uh, over to epigenetics, changing how which genes are actually read, how often they're read, whether they're overexpressed, underexpressed, not expressed at all. Um, it's the reason why you have the same genome, the same DNA in your eyeballs and your bones, and yet your eyes are made of eye stuff and your bones are made of bone stuff. It's because different genes are turned on and off in these different cells. 
And you can affect that and cause different uh, uh, morphological phenotypic effects in a body that can be intergenerational between a couple of generations or transgenerational that last, you know, presumably forever and can affect the evolutionary trajectory of your entire lineage without actually changing the DNA. So there's a million different ways that this works. And it is completely ridiculous to just say, well, any change of information is loss of information. It's all just deleting. It's all destroying. It's a, that just doesn't make any sense. And it just shows that you're listening way too much to creationists and not to scientists. Sorry, Matt, you look two, like you have a thing to say. Two quick things. Uh, one, yeah. remind me later, probably after the show or whenever we get time to talk, I got into an argument with uh, some Kenyan Sanboa breeders um, about mm -hmm. uh, paradoxing and recessive traits. But also everybody was marveling about your whiteboard. Um, but you should marvel that I have a Galton board right here. Yeah. And when Forrest referenced a Galton board one time on the show, it was also right here because it's always on my desk. And I was like, <laughs> I have a visual aid to help Forrest. Just boom, here I, we go. I love that thing. I had one of those for a minute. They're amazing. And I used it to teach with, and then I had I, I got rid of it, but I want to buy another one. They're so freaking cool. And they're such a good Come demonstration on. of like how sometimes math makes more sense than your than sense does. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hey, if you liked this video. Why don't you click that like button? And if you didn't That's like it, you would say, subscribe. <laughs> okay. Oh. You didn't give me a chance. <laughs> it was such a long pause. Two what? What, are you, here. what are you on speed or right, something? Try. I barely had a let's chance. Try again. Hey, I hope you liked. Hey, I hope you. Fuck. Hey there. I hope you liked that clip. Hey, I hope you liked that clip or just now that the one that you just watched with your eyes. If you did like it, why don't you click that like button? And if you didn't like it, tell Jimmy to go fuck himself. Hey, I hope you liked that <laughs> clip right now. If you did like it, why don't you hit that like button? And if you didn't like it, go ahead and subscribe anyway.